My name is Nikki Harry. I'm the Associate Dean of Sustainability in the Faculty of Science, and it's been the Sustainability Network in the Faculty that has hosted these lectures. As this is the last one, I'd just like to specifically mention Quentin Atkinson, who has really pulled together this series for us. If you've been to a few of them, you'll know that we've had multiple speakers um, from disciplines across the university, and it's been quite a thing to pull together. Also, particular thanks to Mark Costello, who organised two of our sessions on the rivers and the oceans that were especially inspiring, I thought, so thanks very much to Mark. The other key organiser, James Wright from Chemistry, I'm not quite sure if um, he's made it along today, but it is quite a big effort, so thank you very much to the three of you for your contribution. Uh, so I'm really delighted that today um, we're going to finish on an extremely positive note. I've been reassured by both of today's speakers. Uh, and the topic is Pathways to Active Inclusive Cities in 2030. And we have Alex McMillan, who got up at 5 a.m., I think, in Dunedin this morning to be with us today. And she'll be talking with us about healthy transport futures that require an ordinary revolution. And after her, Robin Cairns, who will be talking about creating cities for children. I'll introduce them each individually um, as we go through. So, first of all, Alex. Alex McMillan is from the University of Otago. She's a public health physician and a senior lecturer in environmental health. And her interest in cities started as an orthopaedic registrar, where she was engaged in the very wasteful activities at the bottom of the road traffic injury cliff. However, she has spent the last decade on research and action aimed at shifting urban futures towards health, fairness and environmental sustainability. And she herself um, is a cyclist, so knows all about the issues at the coalface. So welcome, Alex. Tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mihi nui te Nikki for the invitation. Uh, Nor Macmillan te iwi, uh, ko Ben Batkiller te Motori, ko Macbeth te Tipu Narangitira, uh, no Ahitareiria, me Ingarani, me Tamaki Makoto aho, um, no uh, ko Ote Poti te Kainga in INA, um, or Alex Macmillan Takoinga. And I need to apologise, I'm a little bit bedraggled. Um, there's a bit of a promise of more of that uh, with, with a healthy transport future. Some uh, more dandy raincoats and uh, town gumboots and being a bit damp around the knees. Um, so I hope you're going to get that this, the ordinary bit and the revolution bit by the end of my talk. And as I go through this bit of a story about transport and the future of transport, I want to acknowledge that my part in it is only one cog in a big wheels. Um, all these uh, rich collaboration, rich in terms of, not in terms of money, but in terms of the fantastic team and the outcomes. Um, and this is a changing and growing collaboration over time, variously funded by these funders listed here. So although we're living uh, longer and healthier in New Zealand, uh, we are in the middle of some interlinked well-being crises. Uh, we have a rising obesity crisis um, with the cost of obesity and lack of daily physical exercise at around $1.3 billion a year. And unlike other OECD, those other wealthy countries, um, we have a rising road traffic uh, injury death toll. Um, and I noticed nobody liked that headline on Facebook. Um, and as well as that, we have the crisis of climate change, which is also a crisis for well-being and uh, public health facing us. And they're all interlinked through the contributions that come from the way that we have systematically built in car dependence, the way that we manage motor vehicles in our cities, and through decades of urban design and transport investment in a particular pattern that has really provided an illusion of individual freedom and autonomy. Uh, and for some, 
convenient access to well-being promoting goods and services, but has had a number of huge well-being negative side effects. As well as the physical impacts, um, psychological and neurological disorders are now the biggest contributor, contributor to reduced health in New Zealand. Things like depression, anxiety, and neurological diseases. So we've paid for the illusion of automobile freedoms, individualism, autonomy, competitive consumption, as well with our mental well-being. So things like social disconnection, uh, stress, depression, and anxiety, but also disconnection from the natural world, from nature, birds, trees, and other uh, natural supporters of our spiritual, cultural, and emotional well-being. And this also comes with some huge uh, health and social inequalities, some deep injustices. So this is the Mangari, picture of the Mangari Dialysis Centre, which opened in 2016 by Jonathan Coleman. has 35 uh, hospital-grade dialysis stations, and it runs continuously, and it's all, always full. At the time of its opening, it was the first community dialysis centre in New Zealand to treat people with end-stage kidney disease as a result of diabetes. And it was hailed as a fantastic provision of secondary health care to the community where it was most needed through a public-private partnership. Uh, but it should really be seen as a failure of urban planning and equitable transport investment that, frankly, we should all be ashamed of. As well as uh, inequities and injustices in physical health outcomes of transport like diabetes, injury and air pollution, which have inequitable outcomes by both income and ethnicity for Māori and Pacific communities. Our research is continuing to demonstrate the deep social well-being injustices in how we've put the system of cities together. Whether it's understanding that difficult diagram on the left about the relationship between forced car dependence, building our cities around car dependence, being forced to drive um, cars which are unwarranted and unregistered um, and without your full licence just so that you can access the basic building blocks of well-being and that leading to, for many Māori young men, uh, entry into the criminal justice system and a vicious cycle for those young men. Or how urban planning pushes uh, low-income households further away from the things that they need to access for well-being through housing and land use policies and then punishes them again through uh, a public transport system that's not fit for purpose and too expensive for them to be able to afford those basic building blocks for well-being. Um, and that's felt hardest by our most marginalised young people, not in education, employment and training, the subject of our Cities for Youth project. Uh, which will be making recommendations about urban planning and transport to assist those young people to participate in society. As well as what we're finding in our research, a shocking prevalence of sexual crime against women and girls, limiting their ability to walk, cycle and access public transport in our most deprived neighbourhoods. And we have, on the other hand, this proposed solution, these proposed solutions to the problems of transport where electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles are sold as the total solution to the problem of transport in what I'm calling an act of technological mysticism. <laughs> Naomi Klein, quite gently, I think, calls these tepid market-based solutions to climate change, while maintaining the socio-technical status quo of automobility and car dependence. But at the same time, not resolving issues of well-being and fairness, um, or even really re addressing the problems they're touted to fix, those of reducing greenhouse gas emissions from transport and reducing congestion. And I love how these pictures have only got machines in them and no, other, no actual people or other modes. So while these technological changes alongside other new technologies will no doubt play a part in a flourishing transport future, What's needed looks entirely different and probably more pedestrian. 
if we had a vision of a transport system that effectively and equitably contributed to well-being for all, uh, what would that look like? We'd need a shared set of values and objectives, including centralising the Treaty of Waitangi and health equity, and that, that those vision and objectives would be shared by policymakers, communities and academics. We need to understand the system of transport and well-being to identify effective policies and investments. We need to be able to value those outcomes in ways that transport policies can use to change in their investment patterns. And we ne need to demonstrate scalable examples for well-being and equity. But as well as that, we need institutional structures, rules, policies and funding structures to be aligned to rapidly scale these exemplars up and universalise them. And all of these things have been the focus of our policy-oriented research over the last decade. So how about those shared values and outcomes? Well, we've done exercises to learn about and centralise shared values a few times over the course of a number of projects. But these ones are from Lucy Saunders' work on healthy streets. Some of you may have seen her while she was in Auckland. Um, she's a public health specialist working at, the, at Transport for London. And she's made the objectives that we've been finding into something more beautiful and easy to understand than we had managed so far. So these are the things that are needed for our streets um, based on strong evidence for what has benefits for health and well-being and for health equity. And especially through enabling more walking, cycling and public transport use and reducing social inequalities. And they're all interrelated in complicated ways. And what's missing from the diagram, I hope you'll notice, is um, environmental sustainability, which Lucy sort of talks about as underpinning all of these. I was really excited to hear by Twitter yesterday that Auckland Transport, Auckland Council have just announced they'll be incorporating this healthy streets work of Lucy's into their planning though I think we strongly need a version for Aotearoa that reflects the treaty, Hauora Māori, and the role of mana whenua in Manaakitanga and Kaitiakitanga. So moving on to understanding the transport, as a, the transport and well-being as a system, we've been doing a bunch of work to understand how those many aspects of transport and well-being that you saw before are linked up into a system and to use that understanding for thinking about effective policies and investments to get the outcomes that we want. And then valuing them in ways that transport planners can understand. So this, the, that circle diagram is just the part of the system relating to how cycling works and what we need to do to increase cycling, to turn it in, from a decline into an increase where we found that investment in best practice cycle lanes was the most important thing to get more cycling in cities like Auckland. And that when we do that well and consistently across a whole city like Auckland, we can achieve much better value for money than building new motorways, for example. Um, so if you look at the gra that graph on the right, you'll see that um, the biggest benefits come from people getting a little bit more routine exercise built back into their day by biking to where they need to get to. Um, and we know that these benefits for every dollar spent on high quality biking infrastructure can bring back around $10 or more in, uh, in savings for the health sector especially. And we know that large benefits are also possible when we build walking back into. But it's not just active transport, walking and cycling in the centre of the city that's important for well-being and fairness. The suburbs are crucial. Not just because they're where most people live, but because the suburbs are where decades of urban planning have been most coercive in requiring car dependence to access the building blocks of well-being, even when households can't really afford it. So using our understanding of the system that links well-being and transport um, and the relationships we've developed over time with transport planners, we developed this unique uh, intervention study for well-being and equity uh, called Te Aramua Future Streets. And some of you may have heard of that. It's based in Mangere in Auckland. So it's a, um, a co-designed partnership between transport planners 
the community of Mangere and the research team to develop an intervention to prioritise walking and cycling that brings together placemaking and infrastructure engineering designs and incorporates indigenous te Aranga principles for landscape design. And it involved changes to streets and linear parks to prioritise what the community wanted, which was a sense of safety from crime, more walking and cycling to access the local places that people wanted to go, like the shopping centre, schools and other education. And alongside the intervention that's been constructed by Auckland Transport um, and co-designed with Auckland Council and the community, we've been measuring a wide range of wellbeing outcomes, including things like physical activity, sense of social connection and sense of safety from crime, um, air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions and road traffic injuries. And the results of that project so far suggest really successful improvements in intermediary steps towards those wellbeing outcomes. Things like reduced traffic speeds, reduced car volumes, how easily people are able to get around by foot and by bike. Improved sense of safety and accessibility for people of all ages and physical abilities. But as well as those intermediate outcomes, and we're still analysing some of the well-being outcomes, um, we've managed to achieve changes to the way that Auckland Transport and Auckland Council do the business of things that don't look like business as usual and engage communities in suburb level change for better walking and cycling. And excitingly, the new Associate Minister of Transport and the Associate Minister of Health and Minister for Women, Julianne Genta, has announced that she wants to put this sort of future streets process and intervention all over key parts of South Auckland, which is really exciting. But there are still many challenges to meet in this kind of work, including how to rapidly upscale while continuing to engage deeply with communities, and especially how to address the ongoing fear of sexual violence experienced by women and girls in communities like Māngari. So while walking and to some extent public transport have continued to get away with being an accepted part of everyday life alongside car use, Cycling, on the other hand, has over time been iconoclastic. A tool for fundamentally altering the status quo, as this, these suffragettes have shown us. But also potentially and unusually helpful because of the way that cycling melds individual freedom with social connection. A modest opportunity to consume with the ability to be environmentally sustainable. And yet, as work we've been doing, led by Kirsty Wilde, who's here, on bike lash, or the organised and vitriolic backlash against the reallocation of road space to bike lanes shows, that while there are a variety of manifestations of bike lash, part of the vitriol comes from the attack on the status quo illusions of automobility. Those messages of individualism freedom and competitive consumption that we've all been immersed in for the past 50 years, which, which have re never really been fulfilled in reality. It's clear from what's ha what happened with the research that we've been doing that framing transport as a problem of well-being can speak across political divides around transport. And so back in 2014, after that cycling modelling work I showed you from Auckland, it was the national government, surprisingly, who announced the largest government spend on active transport through the Urban Cycleways Fund. And Jerry Brownlee, the Minister of Transport at the time, even used uh, those wellbeing outcomes to justify that spend that commuting by bike has health benefits and also, as well as helping to take the pressure off the transport networks and relieve congestion. It was National who also set up the National Cycling Safety Panel and had taken on board many, but not all of our recommendations. And, um, and more recently, as I've said, Te Aramua Future Streets by framing wellbeing has led to institutional change and uptake by leadership. 
But what's telling is the other thing that uh, John Key said on the announcement of the Urban Cycleways Fund was that the funding for this uh, Urban Cycleways Fund wouldn't come from the National Land Transport Fund. And it's taken me a decade to get to the heart of the understanding of the problem of transport in New Zealand. And it's required a lot of analysis of the dominant ways we've talked about transport and how the problems of transport are represented in the dominant ways of talking about it in the media and by politicians and the public. And what's propping up the status quo and stopping the flourishing happening? So over that whole decade, when we were doing this research and feeding it into policy, the, the allocation of the National Land Transport Fund, this is the government's fund for spending on transport, that's allocated to walking and cycling facilities, never got beyond 1%. And the, uh, almost the entirety of that fund had continued to be spent on new roads and road maintenance despite the rhetoric and the evidence. And that reflects the structure of that fund since the 1950s. So what we have in New Zealand is a fund of a user pays fund for transport that says that all the funding comes from road user charges and therefore we need to spend all of that money on making things better for road users. And that's really problematic for getting to a flourishing future for well-being. But not only that, it reflects an extreme uh, neoliberalism embedded in transport policy making in New Zealand. And I don't want you to read all this, but this is, um, I want you to see that this is a quote from the Ministry of Transport in 2014 when they were talking about the future funding of transport and the use of that, what's called a hypothecated revenue. In other words, it's earmarked from road user charges to be spent on making things better for road users. And it's directly quoting um, the arch neoliberalist playbook, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations from 1776. And so while um, cycling infrastructure is a challenge to neoliberalism, we haven't really got uh, a fundamental change to the way that that transport fund is spent towards a flourishing future. And an important reason for that is this propping up of the status quo um, by what uh, Furness and Walks and other leading thinkers in this space call the auto-industrial complex. So we have these very powerful multinational uh, corporations who are influencing the way that transport is spent in New Zealand and in other countries, whose annual turnovers are larger than the GDP of many countries. I think New Zealand sits between ExxonMobil and Caltex or something like that. Um, and who have increasing profit protections reified above well-being, environmental sustainability and human rights in country responses to um, investment and in multilateral trade and investment agreements. And they influence the funding structure, the problem representation, why the problem of transport is, re is represented as congestion rather than well-being, and the policies and investments. And this is really familiar in public health and something that we in public health have been fighting over decades on a range of fronts, including obesity and <coughs> tobacco harm. And that entrenchment also comes through representation. So that bottom photograph that you see there is um, my own local regional transport committee. Um, and as you can see, they're a fairly homogenous group of um, Pākehā middle-aged men. Um, that also reinforces that sta the status quo. So here's my summary for pathways towards a flourishing future. Obviously, a focus on well-being and fairness uh, put at the centre of transport investments is really helpful for getting us towards a flourishing future. And I think we're starting to see this really excitingly, especially in Auckland. The suburbs, as I've said, are crucial. 
And what we've learned from Te Aramua Future Streets and our work on Bike Lash is that future well-being requires placemaking for healthy streets rather than a focus on building bike lanes. That we can harness new technologies in a really thoughtful way to support well-being instead of reifying them. New technologies like electric bikes, smart public transport, autonomous and electric public transport are all able to be used to support well-being. We're starting to see great things happen through iwi leadership in New Zealand, as well as political leadership. Um, but we need the representation of Māori, women, young and old, a range of ethnicities on decision-making bodies like the regional transport committees. And it's super exciting to me to see a minister for, uh, a woman minister for health and climate change and an associate minister of transport and minister for women encompassed in one woman who cycles, including to the hospital to give birth. But finally, we need to change the structure of funding from a user pay structure to a right to access structure so that we can fund as a nation the well-being outcomes we want and build the flourishing transport future that we need. Thank you very much. She has, she has a son, yes. Kia ora tato. Uh, thank you, Nikki and Quentin, and uh, the, the team for organising this series of lectures on such a, a vital and uh, timely theme. So I want to pick up where Alex um, ended and, and ask you particularly to reflect on that very potent image that she put up that I hadn't seen until just then of that, that local transport board. There didn't seem to be any Māori, perhaps, but there certainly weren't any women, and certainly there weren't any children being consulted. So. Um, what I want to do today uh, in this uh, half of the talk is to raise the question, uh, to what extent are we creating cities for our children? Uh, what do children want and how can we better facilitate the development of places for children? Um, this is the challenging gap. Me walking away from a playground in the new uh, housing development at Weimar here thoughtfully because you know, uh, that Neil Young's lyric from uh, back in the 60s, I think, is very potent. I'm a child, I'll last a while. You know, if we were um, to be studying gerontology, we would uh, almost all be um, anticipating a human state that we had yet to attain. But we've all been children. The paradox really is, though, that although we've all been children, we forget what it is to be a child. We might remember rationally what a playground is. We might see a playground and have some sort of uh, memories of what we did, but we lose touch with the feelings of what it is to be a child. It's a sort of a mystery. Perhaps the psychologist can tell me why that happens, but it does happen. And so the, the challenge really is to try and um, regain that sense of what it is to be a child. And really, there is no better way than to spend time with children and talk to children. That is the challenging gap. So today, what I want to do is to reflect on, on the link between place and these pathways that, uh, that Alex began um, uh, earlier talking about, then reflect on two projects I've been involved with and then sort of project into the future. Try to pick out some of the 
uh, more hopeful elements and uh, look at some examples from Auckland and elsewhere in the world. So the two projects I want to reflect on both reach back uh, in time. The first quite a long way back to when I was involved in setting up Auckland's first walking school bus in Mount Albert around Gladstone Primary School and uh, that goes right back to 1999. Uh, and then more recently work with my colleague Karen Witten and others on a project funded by both Marsden and HRC that we called Kids in the City. So to begin, begin with, placing pathways. Um, I guess as a geographer there is no construct I'm more interested in and that more drives my, my vision and teaching and research than the word place, because place is so richly nuanced. And I guess that sort of little bit of uh, algebra, if you like, or equation up there sums it up for me, that the places we experience are intimately linked with our experience of place in the world. And for me, place in the world is about identity and status and uh, who we are regarded as and who we regard ourselves. So where we live, residentially has an impact on how we are regarded, our social status and our identity. Similarly, even the places we spend time. You know, we're here at a university. That, that gives us some sort of uh, uh, regard, both self-regard and the way others regard us. So places are a complex mix of a range of dimensions. Places are too easily reduced to location, whether that be by real estate agents or planners or economists or whatever. To me, places are richly layered sets of social opportunities, power dynamics, material resources, familiar settings, and even personal memories. So for me, that's the a swimming pool at the primary school I went to, that you know, the personal memory part of it would be that my father helped, you know, raise funds for it with bottle drives and whatever, and there's my mother with my baby sister up there, and you know, it's a, it's a place that is both a, a location, but also so much more. So in terms of, of children, and of course all of us, our place in the world or our, our identity is either enhanced or constrained by the degree to which we experience affirming places, places where we feel we can belong and do belong. So this issue of belonging and place is fundamental to the sorts of cities we need for children and, of course, for all of us. So to move to some insights from these various projects, I want to start with the, the walking school bus. Now, I, I would imagine that that intervention is so deeply embedded within the sort of uh, mobility options available to parents and children in Auckland that it doesn't require detailed explanation, and that in itself is a is a great success and sort of source of satisfaction. Although I, I would note that the, the person who came up with the idea, um, David Enwick, does um, disown the idea now, saying it's become too institutionalized. And indeed, really the ideal child-friendly city would not have walking school buses. Children would just walk anyway. They would have their own feral walking school buses, I guess. <laughs> but you know, in essence, a walking school bus is, a, is an intervention that is in part to do with transportation and mobility, but also in part a public health intervention, basically to get children actively and safely from A to B and back again, A being home and B being school. And in so in, and do, doing so, or in so doing, both rege, reduce congestion at the school gate and of course the bit I left off, which is to make some modest contribution perhaps to reducing obesity and promote physical fitness. So, it's, a, it's an intervention that there is a, um, a rationale that has been developed by adults for children. What I want to spend time now is just focusing on the child perspective on this. When we did a, an evaluation of the walking school buses some years into their development, when there were about 100 routes through Auckland, some of the children who we spoke to came up with some amazing quotes, and this is the most, most memorable. I like walking to school because it is our habitat. Isn't that a wonderful word? It's our habitat. That space between home and school. The number of children who said they wanted to walk but were not allowed, partly because of safety reasons or because parents just found it more convenient to drop them off on the way to somewhere else. An entirely rational sort of um, approach to um, time management, I guess, but really taking from children that opportunity to know their local environment and enjoy their friends. Now, I did get my daughter's permission for this. She's now a postgraduate uh, student at this university. 
but she prepared this uh, when she was six, and it is a depiction on, uh, that she put together on her experience of the walking school bus at Gladstone School. And the caption is, it's slightly cut off, but I like seeing my friends. And that again, I think is a very important and salutary note that is more than cute. It's actually fundamental for the experience of place between home and school and back again. It is a time of sociability. It is, to anticipate some points I want to make a little later, it is the space between home and school is like the third space for children between home and de facto work, which is school. And the third quote I want to give you is um, from some work we did following up the views of some children who had been walking school bus kids, and we tracked them down 10 years later. And we asked them questions about their current preferences and practices with respect to mobility and how they felt about walking. This is Kelly, 15 years, 10 years ago, she was a five-year-old walking school bus kid. She says, because we started when we were like quite young, I think there will always be underlying habits of walking. It enables you to become more independent. When you're older, it sort of le leads you into different things. The people who get driven everywhere when they get younger, um, when they're younger, that's something that they just think is normal. So bear in mind what Alex was talking about earlier, this deeply embedded auto-dominant complex. To what extent is that laid down, embedded, within that first five to 10 years of life as something that's entirely normative. That's the question I want to put out to you from this. So the lessons are, from reflecting on this work, children's priorities can complement, if not actually contest those of adults. Remember that the walking school bus set up to decongest and to get people to uh, school and back safely, but kids had other priorities, local environment, sociability. I even had, when I was a walking school bus parent, I very memorable, tried to get the kids to hurry up once, and these two boys, says, they had their heads in the bushes. I said, come on, come on, let's go. Going and they said, no, no, we're watching a couple of snails. We're learning how to snails walk up trees. You know, it's that sort of learning, eh? And then early exposure can, uh, to alternatives can embed future lifetime habits. So second uh, project to reflect on for a few minutes. This comes from the Kids in the City um, uh, project, and here's my colleague Penelope Carroll talking to a couple of the kids who both uh, gave their permission for this photograph and also their parents. And uh, the range of methods we undertook for this, which quite a complex study, but uh, over a um, course of three years, uh, mixed methods, um, uh, time budget diaries, um, go along interviews, as you call them, uh, uh, where, uh, where people talk as they walk, using GPS trackers, all sorts of things. But these are just some sort of pictures of how the uh, the go-along interviews worked. We had teenagers who were trained as go-along interviewers walking with younger kids, and sometimes the parents shadowed the whole process uh, out of a concern for safety, but it allowed us to really understand the, the neighborhoods. What we found, in brief, this is a tiny snippet, what kids like about their neighborhoods. They like having friends close by. They like places to play. They want amenities that are very close at hand. They want quiet and peaceful places. There was a good number of comments saying they didn't want a lot of traffic near them. They didn't want uh, noisy dogs. They didn't want drunk and weird people, things like that. But, you know, Nikki did say focus on the positive, so I don't have a slide about that. I've got the slide about what kids liked. They also like school. So how do we interpret this? Well, you know, I, I, I find the work of Oldenburg very uh, helpful in this respect. He's a sociologist who came up with this idea of third places. It's such a compellingly simple idea that our uh, fundamental, intimate, personal space is our home. That's our first place in life. Our second place in life is where we go to on a day-to-day -day basis, here at work. Some of you may be students, some of you may be employees, but university is a second place. It's a workplace. A school can be a de facto workplace because students learn but third places, we need third places which Oldenburg calls sites of solitude or sociability that are neither home nor work, but they're comfortable places. That all comes from his book called The Great Good Place. He talked about places in America like bowling alleys and cafes, but what we did was think about third places and drawing from the, on the work of uh, uh, Paula Gardner who 
came up with a, a, a more of a fine di uh, differentiation of, of these third places. We identified in the narratives of children and the photographs they took themselves, destination places, threshold places, and transitory places. I want to give you an example of each. Destination places are those, those places that children liked going to, and we could have more of. Places like skate parks, or here kids playing around on a, on a wharf uh, uh, on the harbour. Places that you go to are destination places. But then there are threshold places. These are places that are, I, I guess we social theorists would call liminal spaces. They're spaces in between. In this case, a car park that was busy with cars during the day, but once people went uh, home from work, it was a space where it could become a child's favorite place. You know, that wall is really big and the tennis balls don't go over it. So they were playing squash against this big wall, indicating that children are inventive. They find their own third places. They make places. And then there are transitory places. Now, transitory, it both implies transit, think public transit, but also their use of these places are transitory because clearly in a busy traffic, it wouldn't really work for a child to be on their bicycle there, but there has been some level of facilitation for those spaces to be used. And those were places of sociability and comfort as well. So what is the lesson we can draw from this work from kids in the city around third places? Well, I think the lesson is that children are improvisers, they're occupiers, they're creatives, they are resilient and they will make their own fun and identify their own third places. But what I want to do in the remainder of this talk is ask this question, can we be more proactive than simply talking to children and find out what places they occupy and transition and make? Can we actually proactively facilitate child-friendly cities in a more explicit way? So I want to suggest in the last five minutes or so that cities can, in fact, be playful, creative, hopeful, spacious, and gentle, and identify one way in which each of those adjectives is fulfilled. First of all, playful public spaces. Child-friendly cities are good for everyone. If we make ch ch child-friendly cities, then adults of whatever age or stage can enjoy them as well. And here's some examples from down at Silo Park in Auckland. And I guess I put that rhetorical question up. I do wonder whether we have too much emphasis on sport in our society and too little emphasis on play. Because sport is very regulated and it's very competitive. Play is free and creative and brings people together in a much more organic way. What about creative spaces? Here's an example that Karen Witt and I came across when we went to a conference in Helsinki. It was a former railway line that was disused and was paved over, and it was set up as an area for children and any others to play, sort of temporary uh, ping-pong tables and other interesting sculptures and equipment. So creatively repurposing spaces in the city is a second way in which cities can be more child-friendly. Our third adjective is hopeful. Hopeful spaces are ones in which children can express care and leadership. This was at the climate march in uh, November 2015, where uh, kids were out in front of some of the uh, groups walking. What about spacious cities? You know, Auckland could be interpreted as a very spacious city because it reaches out so far, but spacious cities are not necessarily sprawling cities. This is another example from Helsinki, the wonderful uh, uh, suburb, I guess, uh, called Tapiola, where there has been a retention of the existing trees and woods and lawns and rock formations, and in between, very carefully, high-rise sets of apartments have been put in. It hasn't been a slash and burn and chop and clear, cut and then planting the trees, it has been a careful insertion of buildings so instead of sprawl and autodominance, we have a quiet, gentle, biodiverse, friendly development. It is possible. And then what about gentle cities? I like that word gentle because gentle cities are ones that encourage us to slow down. They invoke a sense of intrigue. Here's a couple of examples from a city uh, named Angers in France that struck me when I was there for a conference last year. 
in the middle of the city square, a vegetable garden. No people in it. I didn't want to be pointing my camera, but there were people who were coming by and stopping and being intrigued and looking. What vegetable is that? Is it growing well? Center of the city, that's interesting. And then the trams, not only slowing people down because of the pace of the trams, but again, intrigue, because the tram lines have been planted in grass and the trams are painted in bright colors. So again, a sense of intrigue leading to a gentleness. So by way of conclusion, I think for child-friendly cities to develop, we need to consider both the big scale of the big picture, the bird's eye view, but also the small details. That's a very sad playground. That's the only negative picture I'll put. Sad playground picture I took in Toronto many years ago. I was back there last month. It's gone, thankfully. But, you know, the idea of caged children with plastic equipment really is a... Uh, uh, unfortunate scene. I think that uh, another way to conclude is to say that in times of climate change, we need more threshold spaces involving elements such as vegetation. Here's a big tree in Freeman's Park that kids called the family tree in our study because they loved climbing it and hanging out in it and they saw it as their neighborhood family tree. But third places are not only found, and I guess that's my message from the Kids in the City study, that we demonstrated how kids uh, create their own third places. Perhaps we can be a little bit more uh, proactive. And uh, this picture uh, from London that uh, slightly older children are hanging out in, finding that sense of intrigue, finding a space to belong. So third places can, in fact, be designed into the city. So just to end, let's bring us back to right outside this uh, room, more or less. This is Wellesley Street here, nice rainbow suggesting there is a sense of hope. Child-friendly cities can, in fact, be achieved and are good for everyone. So thank you. Well, I think that's right. I think that's the way that we do need to go. And I think those of us who uh, are fortunate enough not to live in medium high density probably do have an uh, in, inbuilt sense of resistance and conflict around that in New Zealand cities, given that that's not been part of a tradition. But um, for all sorts of reasons, I, I, I feel that is the, the way to go. And it can release space to have greened space and interesting spaces and spaces for children. So. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really talk about land use and mm. housing density, but um, that kind of well, has very well done, equitable, medium density can, I agree, 
been really helpful for the kind of outcomes we're looking for. Um, I think in cities like, say, Copenhagen, the, the highest buildings probably only five stories in general, but yeah, lots of space for green space and good active transport between the places. Yeah. Certainly, um, it, it is a difficult thing, I think, a key culture to mm. Well, you know, I think the starting point is, is the curriculum in schools and, and, you know, for all the contradictions um, that uh, are embodied in the United States, I, I, I really think one of the things I greatly admire about America is that they have a subject called civics that's taught in schools. And so children learn how society works, they learn how the court system works, they le learn how politics works, they learn how the voting system works. and and you. It is challenging to sort of engage with children around some of the issues if there is no sort of um, classroom-based context for it. And so in some ways I would advocate curriculum change as a, as a starting point to have a more engaged um, young population. But maybe that's a little bit too idealistic. I mean, I think there are perhaps more uh, temporary ways to bring uh, project-related uh, issues into the classroom, and we've got enviro schools, we've got sort of having gardens in schools. Maybe there are ways to uh, try and, uh, you know, uh, invite local board members into, into schools. Uh, yeah, but I think that's a great question. Need to give that some more thought. Uh, you're specifically thinking about children? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, hmm. I, I think scale is an issue and, and uh, you know, clear, clearly moving, moving vertically probably isn't as, as urgent in a, in a, in a city of, of, of that sort of scale. But I think, it, you know, it's still, um, there is still a sort of a national ideology, uh, ideology or, or way of thinking about transport that can filter down into smaller towns in terms of, of uh, uh, the unreflexive driving of kids' places, mm. which happens almost regardless of the scale of settlement. So breaking that uh, propensity to put children into cars so that by the time they get to the teenagers they want to buy a car and drive a car right away, I think that that sort of is almost impervious to city scale. Do you have any views on that, Alex? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think, I think um, some of the issues that have that uh, parents fear in big cities isn't there mm. so much in smaller cities. So, you know, I'm in all city Dunedin, and um, there's, a, there's a, a lot, a, a greater sense of, um, well, a sense of safety among parents to allow their children to be freer in Dunedin than we ever saw it. Yeah, um, and all the things that I've been talking about around healthy streets are perfectly transferable to small cities like this one. I didn't have one, but I can ask one. Oh, great. So, we want to have cities that are more spacious, so less dense, fewer high density, medium density regions, but we also want to have people walk inside and work. They seem like conflicting aims. So if you have a high density region and you don't have to walk very far to get somewhere, for instance, but if you've got sprawl and space, then you need to use a car or to use some sort of automotive transport. You know, I there think we were both agreeing that that an increase in density towards a uh, towards a good balance of movement density with with green space. With and, and just to elaborate, I guess I was thinking of, of the word spacious in as much a sort of a, 
uh, an affective feeling sense rather than a metric sense. So um, you can have a, a place that feels spacious even if there is reasonably dense uh, housing if you have uh, a good deal of vegetation and variety in what lies between the buildings. And obviously for that, to make a piece as well, about how the building here and the retail, you know, the big box retail, which all works very much the other way, and so that's mixing those together. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right, I just had a question um, about, um, sort of like, involving children in, I guess, more than what you were saying, involving them in the consultation. Mm -hmm. Process and if you have any experience of that, or how, um, so there's certain suburbs in Auckland, for example, who are going to have mass development mm. changes and they're consulting with the community, but I'm not sure to what degree they're consulting with children about what mm. they want to be had some experience of that. I, I suspect there is no consultation, and I suspect that the usual reaction would be it would either be regarded unspokenly as a waste of time or whatever information was gained would be regarded as unreliable. There's all these discourses that we associate with children and construct children as, as sort of um, uh, s people who have not yet become. And, and yet I'm, I'm, I'm often um, sort of just quite taken aback with some of the levels of insight that you can, you can uh, glean from conversations with kids. And of course, they are the ones who are going to um, dwell for the longest, potentially at least. So um, I think there is a need to be creative and, and uh, find ways in which sort of small p politics can allow that sense of inclusion. I don't really have any answers on that one. It's a, it's a tricky one. There are certainly parts of the world where there are children's panels and there are uh, opportunities for kids to get a little bit more politically active. In have you? The, um, the Adam Future Street mm. Project, we certainly um, involve children in understanding where they Similarly, the UNICEF-sponsored Child Friendly Cities program, which, for which Whangarei was the first uh, nominated city, offers, um, I think, some very good potential for that. And a uh, former graduate student of mine, Hannah Mitchell, was involved as the first coordinator of the Child Friendly City in Whangarei. And that involved, and you know, that's where we go back to that question of scale. Sometimes in a smaller city, it's possible perhaps to sort of find some points of connection uh, a little bit more readily. Although, having said that, the Waitemata board, Waitemata board of the Auckland Council was uh, very keen to include child-friendly initiatives and uh, a project taken on by my colleagues, uh, Karen Witten and Penelope Carroll, involved the redesign of uh, proposals for Freiburg Place, and that involves some very close uh, engagements with children. So I think there are some um, small-scale uh, examples around. Yeah. And Christina Eggler, you're hmm. In, in this space as well in Dunedin, mm. yeah, involving children in really creative ways and mm. thinking about transport and um, urban spaces. Yeah. Can I just add to that that um, there's a conference coming up at the end of the year, a childhood studies conference, um, that could be of interest to you. Um, do you have another Robin, would you? The childhood studies conference. I, I know there's an annual one, but I haven't heard about this year's one. Okay, so, there yeah. is one, and it's actually been held in Glen Innes. Uh, oh, right. wonderful new mm. uh, community centre, centre mm. um, Fox and Music Centre. Mm. Who knows about it here? Um, the door of the building mm. is actually a really nice mm. It's a really nice building, and they're, they're working on mm. making uh, it registration free. Mm. Very good. Yeah. Great. So, um, Great. So there'll be some, Christine mm. is involved, and I know there'll be some good papers mm. following 
following on from what you what Robin said. Good. Uh, I'm going to mm. have to stop it just for the time. And I know that everybody's putting this into mm. their schedules, but um, out for long, we're after. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Thank you. Thanks.